I want to ask you to continue praying, if you will, for Southwestern University and its students. Um, our little Monday lunch has far exceeded any expectations we had. And as God so often does, he just blessed us more abundantly than we'd ever even hoped. Uh, we're making, the numbers are large, uh, and we are developing relationships that are really strong already. It's, it's been surprising us in the way God's worked. And uh, uh, the president of the university was here last week. Uh, that opened doors. Uh, some of our folks wanted to put together a Pirates Booster Club, um, which the, I saw the athletic director last night and talked to her. She's excited about that. Uh, we are forging relationships, and that gives us opportunities to share. So please be in prayer for that, if you would. Is anybody here old enough to admit having watched a TV show called Kids Say the Darndest Things? <laughs> yeah, that was a way back. Uh, Art Linkletter. But I loved it. And I still bring out clips once in a while about kids say the darndest things because it's amazing the wise things that can emanate from the mouths of children. Uh, don't know if they know what they're saying sometimes, but I'm just in awe of some of the things they do. Uh, and on that note, I read a story about a, a little girl who asked her grandmother, Grandma, how old are you? And Grandma said, well, honey, I'm 39 and holding. And the little girl says, well, don't you think you ought to let go? <laughs> Psalm 71, Psalm 71. You will notice that uh, whenever we begin the study of a psalm that we start with the superscript. There is no superscript on this one. So we don't have a whole lot of information about uh, who penned it, what the circumstances were. But as we continue reading through the psalm, I think it's going to become more and more obvious what the circumstances were. Uh, once again, um, Spurgeon feels that it was probably Davidic. He, he thinks that likely David wrote it, and certainly it could have fit his circumstances. Tradition, uh, church history tradition, says that it was not David. It was an unknown author. Uh, doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit inspired it. It is scriptural. So we don't really know who wrote it, but the sentiments expressed are, are I think you're going to find, pretty much universal. So kind of read with me and and uh, see what you pick up as we read through Psalm 71. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Rescue me and deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me and save me. Be my rock of refuge to which I can always go. Give the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of evil and cruel men. Okay, to this point, part, we, we haven't seen anything that's unusual for the Psalms because certainly you've seen a recurring theme in the Psalms. Uh, it's calling for God's deliverance. It's thanking Him for His deliverance. It's praise for God and particularly for deliverance from people who are persecuting you. Uh, sometimes that can just be life circumstances. I was just talking with a friend about the, the types of things that happen that life just kind of deals you sometimes. And uh, I think at times he's talking about life circumstances, and at times he's talking about people who are actually persecuting him. But he's, there's a plea to God to deliver me from this with all the full confidence that God will indeed do that. For you have been my hope, O sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth. Let me stop right there because here's our first hint. Our first hint is that whoever's writing this is not a youth. Okay. Doesn't mean we know anything about who it is or what their age is, but we know they're not a youth. And, and he says, God, I've known you my whole life, and you've been my confidence. From birth I've relied on you. You brought me forth from my mother's womb. I will ever praise you. I have become like a portent to many, but you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise, declaring your splendor all day long. You think he's got to remind God that he loves him, that he praises him? No, I don't think he does. God knows that. I'm sure God appreciates that. But what I love about this is this is a psalm right now of adoration. He's saying, you know what, God? You've taken care of me ever since I was born. You knew me before I was born. I was in the womb. You've delivered me. And I appreciate the fact that you've cared for me and you've loved me. And my mouth will praise you forever because of it. Now we're going to find out something more about the writer. 
Do not cast me away when I'm old. Do not forsake me when my strength is gone, for my enemies speak against me. Those who wait to kill me conspire together. They say God has forsaken him. Pursue him and seize him, for no one will rescue him. That, I think, is perhaps the best evidence that this could have been David, because this does describe him in his later years, particularly with his problems with a, a, rebellion, a rebellion among his own people, and, of course, another rebellion from his own son, Absalom. Uh, he wasn't old at that time, but in his older years, his hand on the kingdom was slipping a bit. And they did plot to kill him. And I like how he phrases the, what his enemies say. He said, they knew God's hand was on David and had always been on David. And look what they're saying now. You know what? God left him. His enemies are saying, you know, God was protecting him, but it doesn't look like he's protecting him now, so let's kill him. Because God's hand's not on him anymore. Be not far from me, O God. Come quickly, O my God, to help me. There are those who feel, and I don't know that I can disagree, that perhaps the 70th Psalm was an introduction to this psalm, or it was perhaps the same psalm at one time and was just split up. Because if you remember back in Psalm 70, which, remember, was a repeat from Psalm 40, um, that, that there is a sense of urgency. Help me quick. Lord, I'm in deep trouble. Please help bail me out now. And that's what we see recurring right here. Uh, as for me, I will always have hope. Um, let, me, let me go back to verse 12. Be not far from me. Come quickly to help me. There's the sense of urgency. May my accusers perish in shame. And while this isn't exactly an imprecatory psalm, there is an imprecatory element to it because he is taking this one shot. These people are out to get me. May they die. I don't know if you pray that very often. Uh, I hope not. I don't think this is what the Lord intended, but he's certainly crying out for justice and justice now. May my accusers perish in shame. May those who want to harm me be covered with scorn and disgrace. But as for me, I love, and it's the same phrase in the Old Testament when you heard, for example, but as for me in my house, we will serve. I, I, I love the statement saying, whatever goes on around behind me, that's implied. Whatever's going on here or there may be. But as for me, so he's giving a statement, a, a, a definite statement of his purpose. But as for me, I will always have hope, and I will praise you more and more. So what he's saying, my circumstances aren't good, and it would be really easy to shake my fist at you and, and blame you for it. But you know what? I know that you're still in control, and I will still praise you through the trials, through the circumstances. My mouth will tell of your righteousness, of your salvation all day long, Though I know not its measure, I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, O sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteousness, yours alone. There's a concept in there I, I don't want to get away from before we go any further. When he says, I do not know its measure. Uh, often when I pray, I, I think, you know, God, I don't even understand what I don't understand about you. I can't get my head around your greatness I don't understand your providence fully, and that's what he's saying here. But you know what? I don't understand it, but I'm going to praise you. My mouth will tell of your righteousness. I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, O sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteousness, yours alone. Since my youth, O God, you have taught me, to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. It's kind of interesting that he mentions his teacher, and who was his teacher? He doesn't mention a person. Have you noticed? He says, from my youth, you have taught me. Now, we have to figure he had a teacher, but he understands the source of the, of the wisdom, okay? God, I've learned my lessons from you and from my youth, and I'm going to remember it because to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, O God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your might to all who are to come. And if you don't think we're going to get back to the Southwestern lunch on that, you don't know me. Your righteousness reaches the skies, O God, you who have done great things. Who, O God, is like you? Now listen to what he says next. Though you have made me see troubles, many and bitter, you will restore my life again. What does he recognize? Remember, I've told you many times that if you have not encountered tragedy in your life, you will. The Bible promises us that. We know that. Uh, 
Is God the author of that? We can have a discussion about that. Does God call, cause evil to come upon us? I'm here to say generally not, but he certainly allows it because of choices that we made, that man has made. Sin entered the world through one man. And he says, you've made me see troubles, many and bitter. You will restore my life again. He has every confidence. He has the blessed hope that in the end that God will be victorious. I will praise you with a harp for your faithfulness, O my God. I will sing praise to you with a lyre, O Holy One of Israel. I love the fact that David quite often mentions music instruments. I, that's why I think this could well have been Davidic. Uh, uh, if he's not, then the Holy Spirit revealed this to, to whomever the author was. And when he talked about praising, he mentioned music. That's kind of interesting because... That's one of the ways that I love to praise, one of the ways that I love to worship. And when he talks about praising, uh, I fit this in with Dan's sermon this morning, actually, when he talks about uh, where your heart is and where your heart of worship is. And when he talks about the musical instruments, he says, I'm letting it all hang out in worship. Father, I'm going to praise you with the harp, praise you with the lyre. My lips will shout for joy. Did you notice he didn't say whisper? He didn't say mumble incoherently. He said, I will shout for joy when I sing praise to you, I whom you have redeemed. Something that's kind of interesting, there's a concept that is very scriptural that I don't know that we get sometimes, and that's the concept of redemption. Uh, it is all through the, 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 the scriptures. The book of Ruth is pretty much primarily just about redemption. Um, in the book of Job, uh, Job, his confession to God is, I know that my Redeemer lives. And I stop and think, does anybody really know what a Redeemer is anymore? Because the, the original concept of redemption uh, comes from the slave markets, that someone who has lost his freedom, either by being captured or for debts or whatever, uh, is, is released from his, freedom, from, his, from his servitude and made free because someone pays a price for him. Uh, Way back in the day when my dad owned the gas station, he used to give S&H green stamps. Remember those? And when you turned them in for prizes, what did you do? You redeemed them. Okay. So you paid a price to receive something. So don't ever gloss over when it says, I whom you have redeemed. Because what price was paid for that redemption? The scripture says that uh, without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. So the blood of lambs, the blood of rams, the blood of doves may have sufficed at one point, but God says, you know what, we're going to do one sacrifice forever and ever and ever, and that will cover all sins, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what the, the psalmist sees here, that the Holy Spirit has, has redeemed to him. I've been redeemed. My tongue will tell of your righteous acts all day long. Do you ever struggle with the scripture that says pray, pray without ceasing? And what does that mean? Because I've caught myself at times when I'm not praying. And I think, wow, pray without ceasing. And he says, when will I praise you? All day long. Now, let me tell you, there is, I believe there is a bit of hyperbole here. That certainly not 18 hours a day or 12, 12 hours, how long he's awake. I don't think he's saying, I'm not, but he's saying, you know what? Continually. Whenever I have the opportunity, my tongue will tell of your righteous deeds. For those who wanted to harm me have, but, have been put to shame and confusion. Even though they're still persecuting him, he has every confidence that God's going to deliver him. We're going to come back to this. Let's go to Psalm 72. Here's a superscript. You got any idea who wrote this? Okay. This is not only traditional. This is just uni pretty much universally accepted that Solomon penned this. And here's what's interesting, because I have read commentaries. Um, <laughs> what is it Dan says? Please be sure to read your Bible. It sheds great light on the commentaries. <laughs> I, I've read commentaries, and even the note in my NIV, I think, misses it. I think doesn't get the point. And I'm going to ask you to kind of uncover this yourself as we go through Psalm 72. But let me tell you, this was penned by Solomon. The historians believe that this, this was possibly during the time of his coronation ceremony. 
Uh, and let me tell you, uh, I've mentioned hyperbole before. Hyperbole was not uncommon with the coronation of a king. Uh, Jews didn't tend to equate kings with God, although other civilizations did. Uh, Caesar, for example, set himself up as God. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, before God dealt with him, set himself up as God. The Jews, of course, didn't do that because they believed in Yahweh, the one true God. And I think that's a key to way, the way we interpret this. Now, look at what he says. Endow the king with your justice, O God. Who's the king? Don't answer, just think. Uh, NIV says it's Solomon. I'm saying it's not. Okay? But let's, let's read forward. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. He will judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. The mountains will bring prosperity to the people, the hills, the fruits of righteousness. He will defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. He will crush the oppressor. Could that be referring to Solomon? Certainly it could. It could. Let's read on. He will endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all generations. He will be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. In his days the righteousness will flourish. Prosperity will abound till the moon is no more. Could this be Solomon? I think in the, the way that, that the hyperbole that they used in talking about the king, he, they could possibly be referring to himself. Even though he says he'll endure as long as the sun, he's not referring to his physical life, but his reputation and his fame and his renown. So I'm still giving you that. It could be Solomon, though I don't think so. He will rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. From the Euphrates. Okay. Uh, Solomon's kingdom at, at the time of its height was indeed uh, quite vast. Uh, was it the greatest on earth? No. Not even at that time. It wasn't. But could he rule from sea to sea? Okay. Maybe we're talking about Solomon. The desert tribes will bow before him and his enemies will lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of distant shores will bring tribute to him. The kings of Sheba and Seba will present him gifts. Uh, you, by the way, you've heard of the Queen of Sheba, of course, and Solomon. That wasn't her name. <laughs> I just wanted you to know, because I've heard people talk about Sheba. No, that's not a she. That's a, that's a place. That's a country. Okay? Uh, probably in northern Africa. Kings will bring him gifts. Certainly that referred to Solomon. We know that. All kings will bow down to him, and all nations will serve him. We know that historically that didn't happen in Israel, but certainly if you're wanting to toady up to the king... Uh, and, and flatter his ego, you could say that. For he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. This is the type of thing that you might have said at the coronation of a king. Uh, the old great king, he's going to be the liberator, the king of the people. Um, certainly that could have been said of Solomon. Long may he live. May gold from Sheba be given him. May people ever pray for him and bless him all day long. Let grain abound throughout the land. On the tops of the hills may it sway. Let its fruit flourish like Lebanon. Let it thrive like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. And then here's the key phrase that clenches it to me. All nations will be blessed with, through him, and they will call him blessed. Of whom can this be said? Only Christ Jesus. Only Christ Jesus. So, although this may have been sung at the coronation of Solomon, uh, I'm even to grant you that Solomon could have actually penned this thinking that he's talking about himself. Don't think so. I'm not going to stretch that far. But I'm here to say that I believe the Holy Spirit in this entire psalm is talking about the coming king. It's talking about the coming king, uh, the Savior, the Messiah. All nations will be blessed through him. They will call him blessed. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. And this concludes the prayers of David. Uh, this is what we call book two that we just completed. Let me tell you what I think is particularly important about this psalm. 
Is it prophetic of the coming Messiah? I think without a doubt it is. Could it be on two levels? Could it be talking about Solomon and his greatness and his coronation and also talking about the Messiah? Quite possibly. That's not uncommon in Scripture. Uh, happens all the time. But here's one thing I do know that when Solomon, uh, when, when God, Solomon prayed to God and God asked him, I'll give you one thing. For what did Solomon pray? Wisdom. Wisdom. He could have prayed for wealth. He didn't. God gave it to him. Uh, he took the borders of the kingdom further than they ever would be in its history before or since. So God made him the greatest king in some ways uh, in all of Israel. He was in some ways a fool. He wandered away from God. He did some things God didn't want him to do. But I really believe that in this time that the Holy Spirit worked through Solomon, consciously or not, for, for a prophecy of the Messiah. I think it's unmistakable. I don't want to go back to uh, Psalm 71. My focus for today is Psalm 71, 18. Even when I'm old and gray, do not forsake me, O God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your might to all who are to come. Even when I'm old and gray. Abraham was uh, 100 years old when Isaac was born. Sarah was 90 when she delivered. Think about that. How old was Moses when God appeared to him in the burning bush and said, I want you to undertake the biggest uh, uh, adventure in your entire life? 80. 80. And by the time God took him, he was still active and governing millions of people when he was 120 years old. Uh, Dan talked about Caleb this morning. I loved Caleb because he was 85 when they gave, when they allowed them to go into the promised land. He was 85, and he asked God for the tallest mountain with the largest giants to fight. So many people were scared about the giants in the in the promised land, and how would we ever defeat them? Uh, Caleb not only says I'm going in, but he says you give me the biggest giants. 85 years old. Zacharias and Elizabeth were both elderly when God gave them a son named John. When are we too old to serve God? When he's too old to help us. In other words, never. Can we continue to serve in our own strength? Of course not. Even when we're young. We can only do so if we allow God to work through us. And I'm here to tell you today, I believe that every believer ought to be in assisted living. Know what I'm talking about? We're not talking about somebody to bathe us. We're talking about if we try to do it in our own strength, we're destined to fail, period. And if God is for us, who can be against us? So I had something kind of interesting happen just a couple months ago. Uh, some of the people in our congregation, as so often happens, were given a vision of, of uh, ministry. Um, and they wanted to call it Encore Ministries which was ministry by and for what we might call senior adults. You put whatever age on that you want. And uh, so we were, uh, people were signing up, uh, volunteering to work in one area or another, and, and uh, a couple came to me and said, you know what, we've done our time. I said, okay. And I thought, as I went away like the rich young ruler sad I thought how sad that is when have you done your time when have you done your time um, let me tell you I don't know that God's going to call you to, to uh, have a baby when you're 90 uh, I, I don't know if he's even going to call you to work with RAs and GAs when you're, uh, when you're 65 uh, and it could be you just don't have the energy to do that 
Uh, the last time I taught second grade at Camp Crestview, I realized I'm too old to do this. I'm t my knees just, you know, I was on the floor the whole time and my, my knees weren't working. But if God calls you to, to serve, he's going to provide you with whatever resources you need. And I got to tell you, if he wants me to work with second graders, he's going to give me knees. Or he's going to give me one of those little rolling boards, you know, I don't know. But he's, he's going to give me a way to do it. And so I think the concept of just retiring from service is so foreign to me. And it's foreign to God's way of thinking, too. Because let me tell you, Sarah could have said, you know what? Now, nah, you know, I've missed my time. We've had our chance. It's just not working out. But God didn't have that plan for Elizabeth and Zechariah. So I think, what is that, how does that translate to us? And I look at what the psalmist says. And, and look what he said, you know, when I'm old, when I'm gray, what's his prayer? Do not forsake me till I declare your power to the next generation. So there's a verb there. That means I'm not a, a passive spectator, that I've still got something to do. Now, there was a time, particularly back in the 70s, remember the whole youth thing in the 70s? Uh, till all the people who were youthful in the 70s aren't so youthful anymore. Uh, now they're realizing that there is great power going on. But I think society still has kind of funny attitudes about, about as we age. Karen and I had a very interesting conversation today. Um, she was trying something on. I said, that's cute. She said, well, can you be cute when you're my age? And I said, that's a no-win question, let me tell you. <laughs> but I said, well, certainly, because she was, she is. So you're cute. And I said, you know what? Uh, I know, and I gave her two names, and I won't mention them because you probably know them, but I, I talked to a dear sweet lady this morning who's over 90, and let me tell you, she's cute. She's cute. So... What's the definition do we have of, of if somebody worth anything because they're older than you pick a, you pick a time? Um, Justin Dubick was telling me about his father and praying for his father, and he said he's elderly. He's 70. <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> not that far away from there myself. Um, and I thought, what, have, what has society taught us about that? And there was, a, not too long back on television, we saw a, a movie person, a TV personality who had had so much plastic surgery that I looked and I said, Karen, you know, that's, that's just sad. It's not attractive. It's not pretty. It's just sad because... I talked to a woman this morning who was 91 who was beautiful. She's beautiful. So why, why do we have to have these twisted ideas about what we can and can't do that when we get older? And I've got an interesting situation coming up with, uh, I, I don't know if you know, one of my master's degrees is in uh, uh, gerontology, the, the study of aging uh, and senior adult ministry. That and theology kind of work together in the seminary. And what we find is that, that now the entire face of senior adult ministry is changing because we've got a whole generation of people who are 70, 75, who don't consider themselves senior adults. And the, well, I'm not going to come to your senior adult stuff. I'm not a senior adult. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're kind of, I kind of enjoy them, you know. Uh, and so what we're having to do is, is deal with, because for some reason, uh, it's looked at in the pejorative. It's looked at as uh, you're, you're saying something bad about somebody if you're a senior instead of perhaps some other societies where you're actually valued more when you're a senior. What does the Bible have to say about that? I think it's pretty, pretty plain. That even when I'm old and gray, I'm still going to declare your name. Now, interesting thing happened at the Southwestern Lunch uh, not long back. I told you about the one who, who reminded me that, that I graduated the same year her father was born. Yeah. Um, but 
we were just having a, the kind of conversation you can have, right, Dean, when you get to know these kids. Uh, not superficial, but ask them some questions. And I, I said, well, you know, why are you here? Well, the obvious answer is the food, because it's really good and it's free. But, but then I said, well, you know, we've got all these young people that we kind of salted the crowd with so you'd feel comfortable. And, and she said, well, I'm with the young people all day long. I get, I get a chance to sit with you, and she was talking about me and Bill Latham. I get a chance to sit with you when I come here. And I thought, well, big whoop. <laughs> <You know? laughs> what's, the, what's the attraction there? And then she said something about there's a lot of wisdom at this table. And I thought, yeah, well, you are pulling my leg big time. <laughs> and, and she said, no, really. She says, I love to come. And, you know, we've got one kid that is so unbaptist. I mean, you've never seen a more unbaptist kid who comes every week and finds a new person to sit with every week so he can get to know them. And he's president of the environmental club. He's a vegetarian. In other words, he's the anti-jack. <laughs> Anti-two jacks. <laughs> but listen, here he has an opportunity, to, and he knows that, to come and sit with people and get to appreciate them and learn from them. And so what is our responsibility? I will declare your power to whom? To the next generation. And the next. And the next. And what we've discovered is, is questions like, if you died tomorrow, do you know where you'd go? Don't work with this generation. So we need to get to know them and love them and appreciate them and work with them and let them know that we love them. We sent direct invitations to the environmental club. That's why they showed up. We sent an invitation to the, to the president of the Gay and Lesbian Society at Southwestern, which is a large group. Haven't heard from them yet. But let me tell you, they're welcome, and we're going to continue to reach out to them. Because the people that we have there have wisdom to offer. So I'd ask you to, to make this a matter of prayer, um, no matter what your age is. Uh, is that going to be your attitude as we grow older to say, well, I'm just going to kind of coast across the finish line? Remember what Dan said this morning? I've shared this with you before, but I've got I to repeat it because I want you to understand how much it's meant to me. And on, on my 10th anniversary here, which was three years ago, I guess, uh, he sent me an email and he, he told me that he appreciated me. That's always nice when your boss does that. And then at the end, he said, let's finish strong. I thought, my goodness, I don't know that I really thought about that. And I never thought that Dan would ever finish. I just thought he'd go on forever. And I don't know how long we'll be here. But he gave me the image of bursting through the tape at the finish line. You know what I'm talking about? Not letting up, not slacking up at the end, but bursting through the tape like Paul. Think about what God has to say to you through this psalm because I think there's something in there for all of us because we are all, no matter what our age, growing older. I want to share one other thing with you before I, I pray and, uh, and finish today. There's, there's a change coming up. and Oh, I said that word right in the Baptist church, didn't I? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I've been working with the rest of the staff, particularly with Lisa Burkett, our family minister, uh, and we're not really satisfied with the format that our Bible study is taking on Sunday mornings. We are too fragmented as a church, uh, too many people doing their own thing. Uh, and what we like to have is a more family approach so that if possible, all ages are studying the same, the same series or, for example, the same uh, scriptures uh, so that as a family we can work and share that, to get, share that together. Uh, so uh, I, as the person who handles education at the church, have sent out a decree to all the teachers that uh, coming next year, we're, we're all going to be working from the same material. Um, what that means for us is that I have to pick that up in December because there's an, an, another series coming out in December. I'm evaluating a series to, to change to next year, but we need to make a change now. So that means I must needs abandon uh, our study of the Psalms at the end of November. It will only take us through 76, 77, somewhere like that. I've loved it, but I feel strongly, and we as a staff feel strongly, that this change needs to be made. We're, we're still going to be working through the Bible, and we're going to begin a series through Esther, Ezra, and Nehemiah, which 
I think you all will agree. We're, we're, we're great. We're going to love it. Uh, but we're going to begin that in December. There will be a few changes coming. Uh, many of you will not have even noticed. But <laughs> I wanted to tell you that that's what we're going to be doing. And I will, in plenty of time, give you the study notes and things that we need to study before we begin Esther. Okay? So please be in prayer about that change because... Um, we see every day and work with the tragedy of families that are fragmented and broken. Uh, and as a church, we're, we're making a commitment, a covenant that we're going to step forward uh, and work on that as our focus for the future. You know what the fastest growing department at Crestview Baptist Church is? Preschool. Whoa! Numbers, it's senior adults, but percentage, it's preschool, and we built a nursery that we said never will we have 10 babies in beds here at one time. We had 12 last week. Say amen, Kimberly, just any time you want to back there. That's right. We got babies, don't we? God has blessed us so abundantly, so be in prayer for family ministry, if you will. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to come today and study your word, how it comes alive when we read it and how we apply it to our own lives, Father. That perhaps we read the words of the psalmist that when we grow old and gray that we'll still proclaim your name. We're not ready to retire, Father. And we thank you for using us at all stages in our life. I do want to pray for this upcoming Bible study, Father, that as always you shine your Holy Spirit light on it. That we who come will be blessed by it and are able to take it and share it with others. Now as we go our separate ways, please help us to remember, Father, that we are people sharing Jesus. For we do it in the blessed name of your Son. Amen. Please find